Morning, uh, Simon Withers. Um, let's just see. Last time I actually presented was uh, with, with John, was actually back in Dublin. So a bit of an icebreaker because uh, we're on a, a cloud panel and there's about five people, there's five positions and the four of us were there and uh, the, the person at the end wasn't, wasn't, wasn't there. So I've, I've looked at the name badge and seen, uh, the, you know, Edna, it was actually Edna. And I've turned around and said, oh, is she going to turn up? look up and there he is the Irish Prime Minister so a bit of a moment of embarrassment there but uh, I did safely get back to the UK and uh, I wasn't bundled into a, a car with blackened windows um, so I've been able to survive survive that moment of embarrassment um, I'm gonna really talk around kind of bring it back in terms of the state of play in terms of the whole cloud thing and also look at some of the predictions kind of 2012 2013 and beyond um, kind of the, the hover slipper moment, um, where potentially I see and, and, and organisations like SunGuard and so forth see where, where the notion of cloud computing is going. I think one thing which we know is, is pretty unpredictable. I mean, my slide here is, shows a couple of cars covered with snow. Uh, we're going through a, a situation again with our weather. One moment it could be 19 degrees, everybody's out in the shorts, you know, T-shirts and so forth and the flip-flops and the next minute, the, the following day is back down to eight, seven degrees, and I'm sure by the weekend we could uh, probably either go through uh, thunderstorms or through snow. So um, I'm actually in New York at the weekends, and I've seen the forecast. In one day, it is 23 degrees. The next day, it's down to five degrees. So again, unpredictable. Um, so if we look at kind of the cloud state of play, um, we, we, we've seen some of the uh, feedback already, but kind of, you know, are we still you know, in a marketplace which is predominantly still confused? Does it still have that whole cloud washing hype? Um, or are we actually looking for things which are now tangible and real? Um, and a couple of comments I've seen from customers um, and also the marketplace itself uh, on the screen. And, and one of the things, you know, every time I present is cloud computing, you know, it's not a revolution, it's an evolution. It's a different way of delivering IT back to the business. And pretty much, if I go you know, from a technical standpoint, it's around an x86 chipset. It's a Windows, it's a Linux operating system. It's applications which are enabled on that operating system, which obviously with the advent of, of, of Microsoft moving away from things like mainframe and distributed systems over the last 10 years, um, you know, does have pretty much that percentage hold within the, within the IT space today. Um, couple of interesting ones. Uh, I was reading a, a magazine. It was, uh, I think it was a CEO Connect, and on, on the front it had about cloud. And I was sitting next to somebody, I, was on, I think I was on the way to uh, Houston, and turned around to me and said, oh, cloud. I've heard about that. That's using your laptop on a plane. I thought it was absolutely classic. And actually, truthfully, if you look out the window, you're going past the clouds, using the laptop, pretty spot on there. But uh, if we actually look at um, another thing, and, and from a vendor perspective, is it just another way of vendors effectively used to rehash their product and services they may have delivered for the last 10, 15 years? And I've seen that, you know, from having a backup service and suddenly calling it cloud storage or cloud backup. I mean, in the room, how many people 10 years ago, you know, had, you know, Yahoo or Hotmail account? You know, I did, and, and su supposedly now it's a cloud service. So um, it's not necessarily nothing new, it's just, something which is essentially being connected to the internet. So, uh, you know, it is an evolution of the way we deliver IT. It's not a revolution. Um, and pretty much cloud, you know, my view is, it's not necessarily going to save the day. It's going to be, uh, like John said, it's going to be a placement within your organization to, to deliver IT as a service. So which we look at kind of the, the characteristics of cloud, and, and I'm sure everybody in the room, especially in cloud circle, you know, we look at uh, the characteristics of what we, we kind of term as what's a cloud service. It is delivered as a, uh, as a service, you know, predominantly scalable and elastic. You know, one of the things which we have is a number of retailers which have subscribed to things like cloud services, and they've seen the opportunity that is scalable and elastic. So, for example, a retailer came to us and said, look, uh, for, you know, for a month of the year, you know, predominantly December, I have, you know, these stack of 15 servers sitting in a rack, there's power cooling, there's maintenance, there's IT people which need to look after it, and it's there to sell turkeys. 
and I just need it for December. Could you provide me, one, a proof of concept, so I could try before I buy your cloud service, for example, 90 days. Uh, could I also have that flexibility of being able to scale up 100%? Because actually, in that month of de de December, I don't want those physical assets anymore, but I need them for that month because, you know, suddenly all these people come online in December to go and buy those turkeys, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I just want to use that for that one month only, okay? Now, there is an element of scalable and elastic when we talk around some of the cloud models um, where the whole notion is, you know, buy by the minute, hour, day in kind of the public cloud service. But, you know, a lot of CIOs and CTOs I speak to has a budget to adhere to. And they're now facing where they've gone out and done a lot of UAT and development to a public cloud service and seeing that they've got the, the admins and the developers there with a company credit card and suddenly at the end of the month they found a bill for 10, 20, 30,000 pounds because the way some of the public cloud providers charge pr predominantly around things like storage. Um, the other notion is obviously a multi-tenancy environment. Uh, obviously there's the difference between having things like the cloud models, which I'll talk around, is the community cloud, the private cloud, and the public cloud. Uh, it is the metered billing. So we all have, you know, I'm sure the, 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 most of us have a credit card, you know, electricity, phone bill, and so forth. You have your, for example, on your mobile phone bill, you have this set amount of minutes, this set amount of text messages, and you know the cost uh, once you've gone over your allocation. And obviously the other uh, notion of cloud is predominantly being based around internet technologies. Now, a lot of customers we actually speak to is like, great, I love the idea of being able to access it through the internet and so forth, but the applications I actually want to sit within a private cloud, for example, I actually still need that, that private lease line into your data center. Um, looking at the three models, because I think I've tried to explain to my parents, and it's just like, get a blank face. My 10-year-old son, uh, like John's five-year-old son, completely gets the whole technology piece. But when, when I'm trying to explain to my dad, who's you know, 77, he's like, complete blank face, cloud. Oh, is that something to do with the weather? Um, so, you know, to break it down further, I think the, the word cloud or cloud computing, you know, summarizes kind of some of the characteristics, but actually is a delivering cloud services back to the business. I think you do fundamentally have to break down those across three kind of common cloud models. You know, the infrastructure as a service, you know, it's the storage, it's the compute. And pretty much today you're going by some virtual CPU, some memory, some virtual machines to run an operating system of a particular type, which will then allow you to run uh, effective things like platform or application services. You know, the people in that space, the likes of, of SunGuard, Amazon, and CSC, you know, pretty much with Amazon Web Services taking you know, a larger proportion of the, the effective the, the public cloud space, you know, they have, you know, 500,000 plus instances uh, sitting out there across, you know, three, four availability zones, and then the likes of SunGuard and CSC with the likes of having private cloud services around things like vBlock technology from Cisco, VMware, um, and EMC, uh, but also having uh, other services around things like shared multi-tenancy cloud services as well. And then moving up towards platforms as a service where you've got the likes of Google and uh, Azure as well, uh, SunGuard themselves. So SunGuard, just to give you some, some uh, idea of SunGuard as a, a, as a corporate entity, is effectively split across two divisions. We have financial services, we have availability services. So I work for availability services. It's the data center, co-location, managed services, recovery services, and then financial services, uh, which we actually built a European private cloud for, um, which is around things like financial services software. So 75% of, of transactions uh, which run on the NASDAQ actually run through SunGold software. And then looking at software as a service, you have the likes of Salesforce, uh, you know, HR systems, and so forth. Um, it'd be interesting to see how everybody in the room is plotted against those three models, whether you effectively just subscribe to a SaaS and, and probably the, uh, the household name in terms of IT is that salesforce.com. They've obviously moved towards the platform services with force.com where you can enable up to three, 4,000 applications uh, effectively using that same framework. And then obviously players like SunGuard and CSC providing that infrastructure. And, and kind of just an evolution that SunGuard, for example, just sees infrastructure as a service. 
You know, it's just a transport to deliver, again, IT services. You know, we've come from, you know, running virtualized mainframes 25 years ago. So I'm a bit cynical when I go to infrastructure as a service because it's kind of gone from distributed back to centralized systems. And really, kind of, if we look at mainframe services, you can virtualize a mainframe and have it multi-tenancy, you know, 20 years ago, as an example. And then looking at things like SaaS, you know, it is going back to that, almost that bureau service. Um, interesting around things like cloud models, because I've spoken to a number of people who said, if you're not a public cloud, you don't offer cloud services. Yet most of our customers in the enterprise space we talk to says, I get the whole public cloud, but I actually want a secure private cloud. I don't want to access it predominantly from the internet. I do for my admins, which have VPN access and use the internet as a transport to get from A to B, but uh, I still want that, you know, that connectivity, private connectivity. And it'd be interesting when we get to the Olympics this year in 2012, what actually happens with, for example, our internet fabric. Because that's one thing where we, I see very much where we're making great, great uh, uh, strides in terms of delivering IT, using things like cloud services, and that's going very quickly ahead. Yet the thing which we lag, and we lag even more so now, are things like internet. You know, things like, for example, mobile technology. You know, 10 years ago, the UK and, and Europe pretty much was ahead of the game on mobile services. You know, we introduced G3 networking. Now, for example, I, I was, Okay, a bit of an Apple fan, but I actually got my iPad or iPad 3. I went from the 1 to the 3, and I jumped the 2. Uh, I got that on uh, Friday. It's 4G enabled. Can't use that in the UK. Obviously, you know, I'll try it out when I get to New York. But again, this situation is slightly turned because we were ahead of the game in the United States in mobile technology. So I think for one of the things around cloud services, and when you look at public cloud, it's great. The internet is reliable most of the time. But what happens when we get to the Olympics, where everybody on the desktop or on their iPads or their laptops is going to start streaming both you know, the Olympics or European Championships, see what happens to the performance of the network at that one time. But if we actually look at some of the types of cloud, you've got obviously the cloud private cloud moving all the way through to the commodity public cloud, the likes of Amazon Web Services and Rackspace Clouds, which is that pure play commodity um, uh, uh, in environment, which is, again, what John said, is that kind of standardized uh, framework. You can't change necessarily the contract. Uh, you know, this is the contract. It's available for you on the, online. You buy services via online. You pretty much buy that via the credit card. And again, most of the customers we speak to, yep, I don't really want to pay for my IT services by credit card. I want it bank transfer or direct debit. Uh, uh, and I want some flexibility of the contract. And the other thing which is around things like the community private cloud and actually kind of gone full circle because it was all very much on the radar about a year, two years ago was the whole government G cloud. And we're back on that now with G cloud and Sunga and I believe CSC and a few others are uh, part of that program. And you can actually go uh, to, to a government store online, actually see those vendors. And it's pretty much broken across four different lots, which is again kind of those three models which I spoke about, which is the SaaS, the pla platform as a service, um, the infrastructure as a service, and then specialized cloud services. And we actually look at some of the uh, use cases around customer preference. And um, this is some research we did with the 451 group. Um, it's like an analyst um, group. Uh, they also uh, effectively go under tier one as well. But it's more around kind of hosted and cloud services. But pretty much where we saw some of these, these actual uh, type of platforms. If you're a Fortune 500, for example, I spoke to uh, the likes of uh, Barclays or Citibank. You know, they're not going to go on subscribe to a, a, an outside vendor. They're going to. They've got the financial and their game. They've got the IT group uh, to go and build this themselves. So in the Fortune 500 space, you're going to have that closed private cloud, almost building their own public uh, public cloud within their own organization, but have the scale uh, where they can obviously have that elastic capability and, and burst capability. Um, looking at kind of the drivers and goals and markets, um, 
I think we've kind of summarized already in, in some of these presentations as kind of the key drivers, but still very much see the, the same when people talk to us and say, look, okay, take an example, well, I'm looking at infrastructure as a service, or I'm looking uh, for infrastructure as a service which will provide me the failover, recover to cloud, or the burst ability from my private cloud at my data center to your cloud service sitting at your data center, Mr. Service Provider. But I want that increased availability performance. And actually, when you look to, for example, when you subscribe to a service provider, whether it across those three different models, you want to look at the, the SLAs. Because most SLAs are provided around things like availability. But what about the performance of things like the storage? Uh, what are my operational level agreements as well? Does you, do you actually have dual site capability? And it, again, ask the questions. If you look at things like platform or software as a service, actually say, okay, I want this application. That application actually might be sitting on another vendor's cloud. So again, when you look at the contracts around things like the key drivers to, get, to meet those key goals, ask the questions. Say, look, what is your supply chain agreement? You know, what if your infrastructure, which you don't own, you're co-locating onto somebody else's cloud, goes wrong? Ideally, you want, obviously, one of the key drivers is increased IT efficiency. And pretty much around, this is one thing which I, I definitely believe in around the whole cloud space, is that whole automation, that's that orchestration piece. The ability to have a level of self-service, to be able to go onto a portal and whether to have self-service instant in a public cloud or actually have managed workflow services. So um, a number of CIs that I've spoken to like go, I love the idea of self-service around public cloud. The problem being is because I've got this budget and I've got some mission critical apps, I don't actually want anybody to go onto a portal and be able to spin up a virtual machine or have an effect or change the characteristics of my application uh, by a touch of a button. I actually want the service provider, which I'm subscribing to, to actually ma have a managed workflow. So when that request goes in, it then goes to a large IT group, to a specialist, whether it be a firewall specialist, whether it be a security specialist, whether it be a virtual machine specialist uh, or storage specialist, to actually what I'm asking for won't affect all my other applications. The other thing is as well, which is the key driver, and pretty much one of the big winners of the recession has been cloud because you've changed your model from uh, a CapEx heavy investment to, to pr predominantly something running on an OpEx model, pay month or, or pay by the year as an example. Um, which is quite interesting when I actually speak to a lot of government people, they're like, no, I want it in CapEx. I don't want OpEx because I get my budget set to me. If I don't spend it, somebody else will take it away. Uh, but for most of us, uh, the whole OpEx model does, does work quite well. Um, if we look at the market dynamics, um, pretty much uh, resonates uh, from, from what Emma said in terms of um, there are the majority of, of, of companies are looking to be operational with a cloud service in the second half of 2012. Um, they are around things like production application hosting. We as, uh, as a company obviously offer uh, a multitude of services which include disaster recovery and, and a business continuity. And actually what a lot of customers actually like to see is, could you actually spin my applications which are enabled around that whole x86 space, could you actually spin those apps up into the ability to recover to cloud? And if I actually can prove that I can recover my business into a cloud service, and then I'm halfway there to go back to the business and say, yeah, I can actually run my applications. I don't have a degradation of performance. I have an increased availability in a cloud service. So actually, could I move my production applications into a cloud service? So again, it's kind of taking those, those elements of steps. Um, I think when you look at cloud, um, whether it be infrastructure as a service or, or software as a service, if you're going to subscribe to these type of services and, like John said, you kind of almost lessen some control because the, the control is more into the hands of the destiny of the service provider, uh, obviously look at the contract, look at the service level agreements, but do they have multi-site availability? Can they actually provide uh, you know, a service level agreement around things like recovery time objective or recovery 
point ejected to guarantee you if something does happen, if things do go wrong, you know, there is a, Dubl uh, a data center in Dublin which houses two of the largest public cloud providers, which a couple of months ago went down and went down for about eight or nine hours and lost the whole of their European availability zone. And everybody's like, I can't get to my application because they only have the one data center with that capability of their public cloud services in Dublin, and they don't have a second capability. So what, one of the things in terms of looking, and I do look at multi-cloud evaluations, you know, uh, when you look at cloud services, whether it be the infrastructure service or software as a service, you know, do the whole RFI, RFP, it, okay, it's going to be a bit of a pain, it means more work, but at least know what you're going into. Ask the relative amount of questions. And also, when you look at the evaluation of a cloud provider, actually look at and think where you'll be in two, three, four, five years' time. What is the exit strategy as well? Because especially if you look at software as a service and things like John said around data, what if I need to go and use another cloud provider? How do I get my data out? Because the chances are the service provider will say, it's your responsibility. What is the mechanism? And, you know, we don't want downtime. The more be we become more kind of 24-7 through mobiles, through iPads, through laptops, accessing my applications in the cloud, you know, we've had situations. Every customer, every company in the world has an element, whether it be at some moment in time, you've lost access to an application. And people end up just sitting there doing nothing. Yeah? Again, it's time and resource. Um, around cloud, obviously, we're at kind of a lot of the cloud services. Your application is cloud enabled, so it's in that x86 Wintel type environment, Linux or operating system or, or Windows. Um, there's still the need for hybrid. So, okay, kind of when you look at kind of plotting cloud services across kind of your IT and how you deliver them back to their business, is, is pretty much 90%, especially the people we'd speak to, have uh, a requirement for a solution to be a hybrid. Uh, now, the word hybrid, you know, depending on who you talk to in the, the cloud space, uh, would say, well, it's a, a public-private type mix. Uh, in our view, it's, it's a hybrid because you know, cloud service is a cloud service. Um, it's the ability to, to co-locate, for example, a dedicated server, which might be running, for example, Oracle, might be a mainframe, could be a distributed system. You know, I still run a proportion of my business, and I'm still going to run my proportion of business, you know, for the next, you know, five years. So, you know, there is going to be a level of interruptibility across your applications. So again, when you look at that due diligence, when you look at the opportunity of cloud services, understand all the, the, the kind of the points which, you know, your applications and systems integrate. This is an interesting one. Um, actually, I was presenting a cloud storage um, for the 451 group, and somebody got up and said, look, if you know the location of your cloud service, it's not cloud. I was like, okay, fair point, but there is laws, especially in the UK and Europe, uh, we have legislation which have to ensure that the data uh, stays within country or within, uh, for example, the European Union. Um, even more so, when you look at government and when we've done some work with, the, uh, you know, kind of the G Cloud, especially with things like National Health Service, the National Health Service, uh, some of the records, for example, patient records, actually have to stay within, within England. And then you've got a level of security, not only just the physical aspects, the virtual aspects that you have to adhere to as well. Um, so again, if you have to, uh, to work around things like data security and, and location, ask the questions. You know, and, you know, ask the question of the cloud provider, and especially if it's infrastructure as a service, where, you know, not so much the SaaS, because it might just be one application which your business uses, but if it's infrastructure as a service, which is going to, may, may run predominantly most of your IT, well, I want to see the data set up. Have you done vulnerability scans on, on your cloud? Could you provide me the capability of audits, you know? Uh, could an auditor come to you and spend a day with you? You know, again, it depends what level you're at. In terms of if you're a large enterprise, you should be doing this. You should turn around to the cloud provider and go, show me your data center, show me where your cloud's hosted. Do you have dual capability? 
And I see this as an issue. Unless we suddenly change, radically change our laws, which in the state of the European Union, it seems to get more and more controlled, I can't see it happening. So, you know, location is still key. So, um, if we look to the risks of kind of yesterday, when you looked at kind of enterprise IT, whether you looked in-house or you looked to select source, route source, some of that capability to a service provider, you looked at a number of things, kind of the changing market and business con uh, conditions that may require you to expand or, or contract uh, you know, your, your footprint. The, the unplanned disasters as well, what kind of capability you have around availability and what are the, the security c controls and policy controls. Now, you know, when you look to IT, whether it be 2, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you pretty much looked at kind of the element of risk. I don't see that changing in cloud. Uh, I actually see that kind of just, it's old wine in new bottles, to coin the phrase. The security, you still have to look at the elements of security. When I say security, it's not necessarily just you know, physical security. I does the data center have this high fence with this barbed wire and this security access system and does it weigh you when you go in and weigh you when you go out and fingerprints and all that wonderful stuff. There is an element of virtual security, but kind of the separation of that is, you know, you've got the IT security, but what about the security from a business perspective? Kind of going back to what I said is around things like the contract, the supply chain. Are there elements of the service delivered by a third party? And what is your contractual commitment between that party and that party? Okay? And what is the exit strategy as well? Kind of, don't necessarily go into cloud with kind of eyes wide shut. You know, you know, plot that journey. Compliance, again, uh, in terms of compliance, can I do things like auditing? You know, what is the level of security need of your data? You know, the other thing is the connectivity as well. So if you're going to use internet, what are the internet feeds to said cloud provider? Is it dual capability? Do they have, for example, a connection to the London Internet Exchange? If we actually look at the internet within the UK itself, there are pretty much two what's called as NAPs, national access points. There's a, a, an organization non-profit called Lynx, London Internet Exchange, and there is the University of Manchester. Think of Spaghetti Junction. This spaghetti junction, this national access point, brings all these different uh, internet service providers together and allows them to transfer traffic in between. You know, London Internet Exchange runs around 90%, 95% of all UK traffic, actually running up to 55% of all global traffic now as well. Lucky enough now, that's distributed around points of London, but if anything happened with links, we would lose the internet. The other thing around connectivity does uh, cloud providers provide you the capability of terminating private connections as well. So I know Amazon now does that with their, their uh, actual their uh, secure connect services, Amazon Web Connect. We do, I believe CSC and, uh, and other providers do as well. And then obviously the manageability, what level of reporting, monitoring, access to a portal do you have? And again, looking at the capability of the service provider, what is the kind of the operational level agreements that they may hold or provide back to you? And again, kind of moving back to that is the availability, the availability of the storage, the compute, infrastructure service, all the way up to the, the, the software as a service. So that's kind of the state of play, kind of just trying to break and plot some of those aspects down. It's kind of, this is kind of the, the predictions, maybe to kind of almost move into the the hover slip at moments, but um, I definitely think there will be kind of, and again, kind of leading from John, the importance of integration. I think we will move towards more of a multi-model, multi-vendor, whether that, that be a on-premise to your internal solution to have recover to cloud or burst capability, so you need more compute at time and need, you go to a service provider, or you might have multiple service providers. Um, for example, uh, one, of, one, of, uh, one of the people I spoke to is, is Deutsche Bank. They have this capability today. They use this product called Service Mesh. Uh, they then use multiple cloud providers. They have their own internal provider. But they actually 
plot the service provider or the cloud platform to the actual application need or the importance of that application. So highly secure, mission critical uh, applications sit on their own on-premise private cloud. And when they have other applications, they actually have that sitting out into to another cloud provider space. But kind of almost bringing that high, kind of hybrid, kind of public private, I think we're actually start to see as a, as, as kind of a company organization, kind of almost that, that kind of movement of public private cloud and kind of it is just going to be a cloud service. But I kind of like to call it kind of the, the holistic cloud. Uh, that holistic cloud is essentially kind of one seamless cloud environment. It's always on, it's always there. Um, you have that resilient networking, and hopefully networking and kind of mobile, for example, in the UK, um, you know, with G4 networking and so forth, um, you know, speeds that capability up. So you can start to really utilize these cloud services. The other thing is around things like virtual desktop. I think that's going to start having desktop services in the cloud. And then having that traditional infrastructure as a service kind of running that application, but that interoperability, that, that kind of integration to um, obviously your legacy applications as well. And then having an element of cloud communications where you, know, you have that you know, cloud desktop service, and that cloud desktop service is for your DDI, it's for your mobile connection, everything is derived from, from, from that cloud desktop. And, and as we go on, that's where we start to talk around kind of almost the consumerization piece. Which kind of brings me on is kind of the commercial cloud services, you know, um, going back to the conversation I had with mom and dad, they kind of, oh, I've heard of the cloud, that's Microsoft. Because Microsoft in their adverts on television now is to the cloud and beyond, you know. Um, you know, that is going to the, the, the general population. Um, which then suddenly gets this view of cloud. So you do, I like to break it out between kind of almost commercial cloud services and enterprise cloud services. But I do actually think almost the two bridging together through kind of the advent of, of consumerization, which will bridge that gap between the commercial and, and enterprise uh, cloud element. Um, so when you look at consumerization, when, for example, if I look at Generation Y, everybody coming out of university now wants the iPad, they want the Mac, you know, I keep saying back to, to SunGuard, you know, I have a, I have a Mac, you know, I, that's, I, I see the bridge between my commercial services I use for like, example, like Dropbox or enterprise services actually bridging together. Why don't you provide me a kind of icon where I can literally spin it up and have almost that virtual desktop in the cloud where you have that element of control. There obviously there's got to be policies, for example, you know, if I'm going to have this Mac, I should have a next day engineer on site because if suddenly something happens and it's my device, I effectively need to go on, get that fixed. Um, I do see the kind of element of kind of almost having that capability and there are a number of um, software providers which allow you to kind of almost have that single interface. Um, uh, kind of the, the probably the big name is the likes of RightScale, um, which allows you to have that kind of almost one management window to multiple clouds. You've got the likes of Digital Minds, Cloud Vertical, and so forth. But kind of giving you that cloud overview and monitoring, so you have an on-premise cloud, you have a, a recovery cloud, you have uh, you know, a test dev cloud, for example, at CSC or, or Amazon, an enterprise production cloud, uh, you know, at SunGuard, for example. I want to see that in one window. You know? I want to see that overview, the monitoring. I want cloud cost analytics. I want to know the cloud cost, the usage, and the availability, and I want reporting. You know, I want to know exactly, down to almost the hour, how much that cloud service relates back to my application. Um, the death of infrastructure as a service as we know it. I do actually think uh, infrastructure as a service right now, where you subscribe to infrastructure as a service, you subscribe to this amount of virtual CPU, this amount of RAM, this virtual machine, two, three, four, five years, that's going to be irrelevant. You know, more so where, for example, an SME, small medium enterprise, where it has a reduced IT capability, IT team, where you've got the, almost the accountant doing the window support and everything else. I don't care about infrastructure as a service. You know, I want to move towards platform as a service 
I want to have the introduction, and, and a number of providers are starting to move this way. It was, you know, we've seen something very successful in kind of iTunes. You know, like my son, 10 years old, goes onto iTunes, able to go and download an app, music, doesn't care where it comes from, most of the time doesn't care about the cost because it's dad's credit card. Um, but, you know, I have the capability. I want to download something in 10 seconds. So kind of the infrastructure as a service, def of infrastructure as a service, is kind of don't care about the virtual machine anymore. I want that business capability, that enterprise iTunes store. And kind of I want an application aware cloud. And kind of that moves into the space of things like integrated expertise, where, where you've got that enterprise application store, you know, I go and put my specific business rules into the applications that I need through effectively an ISV network or ISV uh, ecosystem. I put those business rules in and it goes and works out how much infrastructure I want. I want it highly available. Put it across two sites. Yeah? I want a performance of this SLA against the storage performance, the compute performance. Go and work that out for me. I'm not interested. <coughs> So again, I do see a massive move from an infrastructure as a service provider up towards things like platform services, which kind of brings us on to the last one, which is kind of almost having cloud intelligent applications made available by kind of, kind, of, kind of cloud stores, kind of iTunes mold, so to speak. So everything kind of, you know, in future kind of platforms as a service clouds is included. You know, for example, that bit there, uh, you know, I just want to put my business rules to an application. So why should I need to understand infrastructure as a service if I go and select source some of these cloud services or bring this kind of capability back in-house towards a, a private cloud? Why can't I have application clouds in a box? However, regardless of this, we're still going to have all of the same issues 2015, 2018, unless things like, for example, like compliance and so forth, we suddenly change our jurisdiction, the European Union becomes more open. Euro might not still exist, but I'm sure the European Union will. And we're still going to have the same issues that we face today, tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>